Well, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, the 23rd annual Max Brutz uh, um, Science Writing Award Ceremony. Um, the aim of the ceremony is to help our current Medical Research Council funded PhD students uh, gain the skills to communicate their research uh, with the public. Uh, the award aims to encourage and recognize outstanding written communication. Um, I just want to uh, warn you that the meeting is being recorded um, and uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Jurat Hassan and the rest of the team who've uh, put this meeting uh, uh, online. So um, the Max Brut Science Writing Award is one of several initiatives that we run to encourage and support our scientists to communicate their research to the public. Um, it's an important part of our mission uh, to uh, involve uh, the public and patient communities in uh, having a dialogue about the research we fund, because ultimately the money that we spend on research uh, comes from the taxpayers. And so this should be very much uh, a partnership between funders, the researchers and uh, the wider community uh, to push forward our goal of improving human health. In this competition, we ask our PhD students to present their research in 1,100 words. Uh, and in that quite short um, um, piece of uh, text, they have to describe the importance, relevant and excitement of their work to a non-scientific audience. Um, this year, I was really pleased that we had a record uh, number of entries, 140, uh, which is uh, a significant increase on previous years. And um, it was very hard for us, but we managed to shortlist uh, 100, uh, sorry, 10 outstanding writers. Um, and the effort of doing the shortlisting and uh, reading fell to uh, staff with, within MRC. It's a, a task that uh, we all enjoy every year. So this event isn't just an opportunity to announce the winners, but also to celebrate the achievements of all 10 shortlisted candidates. Their articles represent the fantastic breadth of research that we fund from discovery research to clinical studies and the development of new technologies. Topics include disease pre prevention, precision medicine, and new ways to treat mental health conditions and tackle the problem of antimicrobial resistance. So judging this year was based on uh, the following four criteria. Um, does uh, the article grab the interest of readers from the very first word to the very last word? Does it convincingly answer the question, why does this research matter? Does it explain the research in a way that is easily understood by a non-scientific reader? And is it well-structured? So using conversational language, uh, relatable anecdotes and personal experiences, the writers grab the reader's attention and explain simply and clearly why their research matters. I'm really proud to say that in the years that we've been running uh, the award, uh, previous winners have gone on to win uh, National Science uh, Writing Awards, give TED Talks and even, dare I say, become BBC presenters. Um, encouraging our researchers to take their science uh, and make it accessible to non-scientists is more important than ever before. Um, and it, you've seen during the COVID pandemic how um, it's been important to, um, for, for scientists to provide unbiased advice on the evidence uh, of um, the nature of uh, the pandemic uh, and I'm proud that MRC has contributed to funding uh, clinical studies, such as the one which showed the benefits of dexamethasone. And we pump primed uh, the Oxford and Imperial vaccines, as well as other therapies. So being uh, straight about what we're trying to do, uh, explaining it, uh, and when we don't understand uh, all of the details, be, being uh, straightforward about that is really important. So it's now um, my pleasure to, um, as chair of the judging panel, to uh, thank and introduce my fellow judges. Uh, we have Dr. Roger Highfield, uh, MIC council member, uh, and he's the science director of the Science Museum Group. Andy Ridgway, a journalist and senior lecturer in science communication at the University of the West of England in Bristol. 
Ian Tucker, who's the Science and Technology Editor of The Observer, and Samira Ahmed, who's a, a well-known journalist and broadcaster. This year, I'd also like to thank the Association of British Science Writers, because they've offered our winner a free membership uh, for a year with the goal of further improving their skills and interest in science writing. And they've also offered half price membership to all entries into the competition. So uh, with that, by way of an introduction, it is uh, a huge um, pleasure to introduce uh, Robin Perutz, um, who will give uh, a presentation uh, now. So over to you, Robin. Hello everybody. I don't know whether you can see me, hear me, uh, but please send a message if you can't. Uh, I'm Max's son uh, and uh, doing my best to substitute for Max. It's too bad that I can't come and talk to you all and hear more about your work, but uh, that, that's how we're limited. Uh, maybe, uh, Jurat, can you put on the first slide, share the screen? Ah, oh, that's lovely, thanks. Uh, so, uh, there, there's a picture of Max, uh, taken when I was growing up, so you can have, see what he looked like. Um, Max is known, was known as one of the founding fathers of what we now call structural biology. Uh, and his favorite molecule, favorite protein was hemoglobin. So he and John Kendrew worked out methods of deducing the molecular structures of proteins. And these days, if you open any issue of science or nature, you're bound to see a new protein structure uh, there produced in large numbers. So hemoglobin uh, structure is was one of the aims and you can see a modern representation of it uh, on the slide there. But Max wasn't satisfied with that, he wanted to know how it works, uh, he wanted to know about he hemoglobin diseases, there are lots of hemoglobin diseases and there are lots of mutant hemoglobins in people. Uh, he wanted to know about hemoglobin evolution and adaptation in animals. Uh, perhaps one of the most important things that he developed was how to look how drugs bind to proteins. And nowadays that is of critical importance in the development of new drugs. So on the right, there's actually a picture of a postage stamp which commemorated his centenary uh, in 2014. Uh, so uh, he really got a lot of publicity. If we can move to the next slide, uh, unfortunately I can't see your faces, but here the, the, I, I had cut off some of the previous slide. That's actually me aged four. Uh, 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 that was the second half of the slide. Let's move on. So Max started popular science writing uh, when he was about 30 uh, and he continued with popular science writing up until almost his final year until he was about 85. This particular um, issue of New Scientists I showed, you probably can't see, is dated 1971, front cover, Max Baruch's How Hemoglobin Works. Uh, hemoglobin, the molecular lung, uh, that was one of his favorite metaphors for how hemoglobin worked. And if I could have the next slide, please. He also managed to put across some of the ideas of molecular biology and protein structure on the television screen. So here is a still with one of the early models of hemoglobin just made from balsa wood and pictures of crystals. And you can see him and the presenter uh, 
Ian Baxter, I think it was, who looks unbelievably awkward by modern, modern standards. I'm sure Samira uh, uh, will uh, be amazed at how clumsy people were compared to modern television. Next slide, please. Uh, so the role of protein structure in disease has never been more important and hemoglobin structure took years and years to work out but now you can do things so much faster and here's a picture of the RNA polymerase of SARS-CoV-2 that was uh, published in May in Science. Uh, so that was four months after the disease emerged. It was by no means the first protein structure, but a particularly spectacular and important structure that could be determined. And that sort of structure will inform much of the disease treatment as we move forward. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so science in a pandemic. Uh, there's another pandemic which is still going on, though it doesn't get much publicity at the moment. Uh, it resulted in 690,000 dead people in 2019 worldwide, 33 million dead overall, and that of course is HIV. When HIV emerged in the 1980s, the Medical Research Council asked Max to chair a group to stimulate research into HIV. And that wasn't easy at all because uh, so little was known about this sort of virus and what caused uh, HIV. It was hard to get people going, but Max put his heart into trying to get that research going and a lot of new science emerged. There was another problem with HIV uh, which is very familiar and that was disinformation. There were no social media but that didn't stop dis disinformation. Disinformation appearing on television and Max uh, was really shocked by what he heard and worked hard to tr try and ensure that everybody realized that HIV was indeed caused by a virus. So let's move on. Next slide, please. Um, finally, I'd like to congratulate you all. Uh, your essays were wonderfully enthusiastic. Max was always incredibly enthusiastic, not only about his own research, but about other people's research. He loved talking to research students about their research. And Yulia, uh, you talk to your Chagas disease parasites. I'm sure Max talked to his crystals too. So congratulations to you all. Uh, and let's move on to the next stage of the evening. Right, thank you very much, Robin. That was really nice. Um, it was nice to see you as a four-year-old. You're actually still recognizable, I would say. Um, so it, it, now I would like to uh, pass over to uh, Samira and she is going to introduce the 10 shortlisted candidates. So over to you, Samira. Am I in the vision yet? Right. I'm not sure that you can see me yet because I'm seeing Fiona's slide still, but I've started talking. Um, and so stop me if I'm wrong. Um, it was a huge honour to be asked to be a judge for this, actually. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I can't tell you how much I enjoyed spending time with the words of experts and all of you as PhD students 
you know, are already experts, you're focusing in at the start of your careers, which is also what was lovely. But the importance in the current time of giving support to scientists who are doing research for the future and in communicating it. And Robin spoke so movingly about his father, and I was reading about Max as well, and was struck by him being a big campaigner against the kind of anti-science uh, movement that was really kind of kicking off in the 70s and continued into the 80s and well we know where we are now with that so as I say it was it was inspiring for me to spend time with all these individual pieces of research and the effort that had gone in to trying to communicate them to a non-specialist audience and um, making us appreciate all these different races in a way that are being run that hopefully will help culminate in, in all these amazing improvements in um, in science and, and in health. Um, the importance of understanding is really key. I know that it can be frustrating for scientists to feel that um, journalists in particular are ignorant and um, don't appreciate um, the way that science thinking works. And so again, this seemed to be a really important opportunity to connect mass communication and public understanding with the specifics of science work. Um, so thank you all for your wonderful stories. Every single one of them intrigued and gripped me. Um, and as I say, it was exciting to get a glimpse into your minds uh, relatively early on in your careers. And I look forward to seeing what you all go on to do. Um, I'm going to introduce the candidates now. And I thought what we'll do before we sort of go into them in detail is we've got a little bit of a video so you can get to meet all the shortlisted candidates. <laughs> I think it's really important for people to be aware of bacterial infections and antibiotic resistance and the impact that can have on diagnosis and treatment of these infections worldwide. In Brazil and many other developing countries, tuberculosis is a major health issue. And from those cases, about 45% is of drug resistant cases. And that's a massive amount of patients that have to seek more aggressive therapies that are often ineffective. And I felt that that was motivation enough. During my PhD, I've been paired up with a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis. This means we've been able to talk about how my research impacts them, and it's given some weight to my research, and it's shown me how small bits of research can cause a big impact into a patient's lives, and therefore have shown me what sort of research I need to do. Because I believe that scientific communication is an extremely important skill for a scientist to have. Um, so entering the competition for me was the perfect opportunity to practice and develop that skill. I believe that the ability to communicate science to the general public is a skill that every scientist as well as PhD student needs to have. What's more, the competition is fun. It's a way of getting your creative side out, which you otherwise wouldn't be able to do most of the time in your PhD. I wanted to communicate my research to a wider audience, including non-scientists. I took the opportunity to think about how to better explain my research to parents and to the wider public. I found that breaking down complex scientific concepts into their most basic building blocks and then relaying that in a clear, concise way that anyone can understand is a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. Um, but writing this article really forced me to practice and develop that skill. The one thing that this really helped me learn and um, develop was to really think about how to pinpoint my main research purpose, right? So in other words, identify the focus and my motivation for the research and convey that in a relatable and concise manner. Firstly, the importance of being able to effectively communicate the narrative of my research. And secondly, that understanding a concept really well yourself is essential to being able to explain it clearly to someone else. In this current day and age, when everyone has access to internet and social media, it is increasingly important that scientists share their research in a more widely available and easy to digest way. I think this could go a long way in preventing spread of misinformation. Making science open and accessible to the public inevitably creates better science. It encourages us to think about the big picture and why our research matters. 
relevance to society builds support, which in turn increases the impact of our research. So I believe that scientific development is one of the key ways that we can improve our society. And you can't inspire people to feel the same way as you if they don't understand the science. And that understanding has to start with good, clear scientific communication from the researchers. Fantastic. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to now introduce the Max Perot Science Writing Award 2020 candidates. They are Kirsty Balachandran from Imperial College London for her article, Progesterone, an untapped resource for treating breast cancer. Miranda Buckle, who's an MRC doctoral training partnership um, candidate at the University of Oxford for her article, Baby, What's on Your Mind? Our third candidate is Isabella Goldsborough from Imperial College London for her article, Finding the Path of Least Resistance. Our fourth shortlisted writer is Jonathan Lewis from MRC versus Arthritis Centre for Musculo Musculoskeletal Aging Research at the University of Birmingham. His article, To Infinity and Beyond, Finding Treatments for Space Travel Bone Loss. Our next shortlisted writer is Maria Stavrou from the University of Edinburgh for her article, Undoing the Straitjacket. Fernanda Subtil from the Francis Crick Institute for her piece, From the Palace to the Favela. Sarah Taylor from the MRC Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine at the University of Edinburgh for her article, Curing the Incurable, Teaching an Old Drug Nutrix to Fight Ovarian Cancer. Elizabeth Trim, MRC Doctoral Training Partnership at the University of Manchester for her article, A New Gold Standard in Infection Diagnosis. And the last two of our shortlisted writers, Stephanie Earth from the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at the University of Cambridge for the tip of the self-harm iceberg. And Yulia Chisor from the University of Dundee for the game of hide and seek. Many congratulations to all of you for 10 terrific pieces of writing research. Um, thank you very much, Samira. Um, I'd now like to um, we, um, congratulate... Oh. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Samira. Um, I would like to uh, lead everyone in uh, a round of applause um, for uh, our shortlisted candidates. Um, so now I'd like to pass on to uh, Andy Ridgway um, and um, he is going to tell us about his experience as a, a judge this year um, and then he's going to present uh, the three commended awards. So over to you Andy. So, um, hello everyone, it, it is lovely to see everybody this evening um, because um, first of all it, it's great to be able to put a, a face to all of those entries that all of us judges uh, spent a lot of time looking through. Um, and I have to say, it was just an absolute pleasure to read um, all of your entries. Um, and the thing that really struck me this year um, was that the, connect the connection that um, many of you had formed um, with your patients, um, in several instances, were invited into sort of consultations that you were having with your patients. And um, we got a real sense of the empathy that you have for them and also the frustration um, of the sort of unanswered questions that it left you with um, and the sense that you wanted to help them more and how this was a real motivation um, behind your research. And these are the sides of um, 
research reporting that often don't get told um, and they're best told by the people who are doing the research so um, I really hope that um, the experience of being shortlisted here will sort of give you impetus and encouragement uh, to, to want to continue your writing endeavours. So um, let's move on to the, uh, the presentation of the awards, which is the bit that I'm sure that you've, you've all been waiting for. Um, so what we're gonna do is uh, announce, uh, announce the three commended articles followed by um, the runner-up, and then finally the, the winner. Um, and the good news is that there are, there are cash prizes. So the winner will receive one and a half thousand pounds. The runner-up will receive 750 pounds. Um, and the commended entrants will receive 400 pounds. And the remaining five shortlisted uh, candidates will each receive 250 pounds. Um, also, a uh, fantastic addition for this year is that um, the winner will have their article published in The Observer on the 18th of October. So they'll be given um, a great deal of exposure. So that, that's terrific. Um, and all the shortlisted candidates are invited to a science writing masterclass by SciConnect. So that's a really good opportunity. So let's now move on to um, naming the, the commended and runner-up and, and the winner. So we're going to start um, with the commended entrance. So I'm happy to announce that the first commended award goes to, and this is the bit where we need a drum roll, Fernanda Suttil from the Francis Crick Institute with her article from the palace to the favela. So congratulations, Fernanda. Thank you. So Fernanda um, told us about her research on TB and um, we learned about her frustration that um, she often has to explain to people the, uh, the prevalence still of tuberculosis. Uh, and that it is still a condition that sadly takes many lives. Uh, and she uh, told us about her, her research um, into antibiotic resistance uh, and trying to solve that as a, as a problem in, in terms of forms of treatment for that. So congratulations again to, to Fernanda, well done. So the second commended uh, award goes to Maria Stavrou from the University of Edinburgh with her article, Undoing the Straitjacket. Congratulations, Maria. Thank you. So well done. So um, Maria's article um, told us about her research into uh, motor neuro disease, uh, recreating a model of the uh, disease in, in a dish to try and understand more about uh, glial cells and in particular astrocytes. Uh, and one thing I do remember from that was an excellent use of the word boffin. It's a word that we don't hear often enough, so terrific, thank you. So well done, well done to Maria. Thank you very much. Um, and the final uh, commended award goes to... Miranda Buckle from the MRC Doctoral Training Partnership at the University of Oxford for her article, Baby, What's on Your Mind? Well done, well done, Miranda. So Miranda's article um, told us um, about some misconceptions that have, have lasted until the, the 1980s that newborn infants uh, couldn't feel pain. Uh, and the research that's taking place now into trying to understand more about um, how babies sense pain and, and trying to measure it, which is something that's it's not easy to do. So congratulations to Miranda for her commendation tonight.
Uh, I don't know if you can see me, but I think you can hear me. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, uh, Andy, for that, introducing the uh, commended um, awards. And now I'd like to, uh, now I would like to pass over to um, uh, Roger Highfield. Um, he's going to tell us about his experience as a judge uh, and present the award for the runner-up. So over to you, Roger. Thank you, Fiona. Um, well, I've judged an awful lot of science running competitions and even with the help of my brilliant fellow judges, I still found it really hard to shortlist 10 from the 140 entries, let alone pick the winners. And what I really liked was the incredible uh, diversity of fascinating subjects in the shortlist. We had links between hormones, DNA, repair and cancer. There was work with colloidal gold, antibiotic resistance, how to make organs transparent, stem cell research, of course, machine learning and mental health, um, and, you know, so much more as well. So um, now, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, announce the runner-up, and let's have the uh, wonderful drum roll and sting. So many congratulations to our runner-up, Yulia Chiso from the University of Dundee for her entry, The Game of Hide and Seek. And it was nice to hear Robin Perutz uh, mention it in his uh, introductory remarks. Please um, put your hands together. Give Julia a, Julia a big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now back to Fiona. Thank you very much. I'm just waiting for my screen to come on. Great. Uh, so uh, I'm sure the tension is um, palpable. It's palpable even though we're, we're virtual. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Ian has been unable to, judge, to join us um, because he's been uh, kept uh, at his editorial duties at The Observer. Um, and so I'm going to stand in uh, for Ian. Uh, and um, uh, announce the winner of uh, this year's award. It was really uh, great having Ian on the judging panel. Oh, Ian says that he's here. <laughs> um, this is to add to the anticipation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will now unveil Ian. Ah, I can see you on the screen. And uh, take it away, Ian. Hello, can you? So, um, yes, I am here. <laughs> and um, I had some problems um, logging on at work, so I'm at home. <laughs> um, so thank you, Fiona. I mean, judging this year's prize was such a um, welcome respite from dealing with the stories about COVID-19. Other, uh, 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 other disturbing, um, disturb. Is this working? Getting lots of error messages. Um, we can hear you, Ian. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, we can see you. Okay. So it was, it's just been really heartening to uh, read about the fascinating work of lots of young, talented researchers. Who are just trying to solve lots of pressing, challenging health problems, and to uh, you know improve the improve and extend the lives of other people. Um, it was really tough choosing a winner from the um, uh, ten shortlisted entries. But I hope um, we came to a we came to a came to a conclusion in the end after much uh, much heated debate. Um, so, without further ado, the uh, the winner of the uh, Max Prutz Science Writing Award goes to, drum roll please. <music> to, to Sarah Taylor from the MRC Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine at the University of Edinburgh for her piece, Curing the Uncurable, 
teaching an old drug, new tricks to fight ovarian cancer. Congratulations, Sarah. Um, Thank you very much. We, we, we found the piece, you know, it, 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 it drew the reader in with a vivid description of a, a patient's predicament. It used statistics in a sparing but relevant way, and it conveys kind of complex science in, in an engaging way for the a general reader. Um, the piece focused on the paradoxical fact that disabling repair proteins um, can help in the fight against cancer. Congratulations, Sarah. Okay, uh, thank you and congratulations for, from all of us as well. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Samira, who is going to read an excerpt from the winning uh, article. Fiona, thank you so much. Um, and I should say, Sarah, I feel you deserve Helen Mirren, no less, but you, it's me. Um, but it was a pleasure reading your prose. Um, so this is from Sarah Taylor's article, Curing the Incurable, Teaching an Old Drug, New Tricks to Fight Ovarian Cancer. High-grade serious ovarian cancer is a devastating form of the disease. Only 35% survive longer than five years following the diagnosis. While chemotherapy and surgery are highly effective at initially shrinking tumours, the cancer continues to fight back. Well, over time, the tumour changes with cells that survive treatment prevailing and replicating, passing on the protective traits that give them that survival edge. The tumour becomes completely resistant to chemotherapy and no barrier remains to stop it from growing out of control and overwhelming the body. However, there are groups of patients whose cancers are much more sensitive to chemotherapy treatment than others who can be completely cured by chemotherapy. One key to this is DNA repair proteins, the tools that all cells use to protect their DNA from damage. Think of this DNA as the instruction manual for a cell, detailing how to build all the problems, build all the proteins the cell requires um, to live and to carry out different functions. Cancer cells often have defective DNA repair proteins as this allows them to adapt and grow rapidly. Strange as it may sound, that can be a good thing from our perspective. Chemotherapy kills cancer cells by attacking their DNA and those which lack DNA repair proteins essentially forgot to bring a first aid kit. They cannot fix themselves up and keep going. This means that the chemotherapy can completely kill off the cancer so the patient will survive. This reveals gaps in the armour of this cancer, which we can exploit to help the women who need it most. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Samira. And that was a really uh, very worthy winner of this year's prize. It was hard for us to um, pick, but we're very happy with that. And we're very pleased that it's going to be um, published in The Observer. Well done, Sarah. Yes, well done. And well done to uh, all of our guests. And I'd like to say a particular uh, welcome to Miranda Buckle, who has uh, just sneaked in uh, out of uh, her responsibilities uh, in, in Oxford. So Miranda, you're very welcome. Um, so uh, to uh, give you um, my final comments, the, uh, I'd like to make sure that the uh, judges and uh, the finalists remember to stay on the call um, because we're going to take uh, a group photograph. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Robin uh, for um, his wonderful presentation. Our judging panel, uh, um, our VIPs have all been fantastic. All of the internal judges who um, went through a large number of applications, uh, short, all of the shortlisted candidates, um, all of the entrants, and then we have a, this event does not happen spontaneously, so I'd like to thank Sarah Brigan and the JRS design team, uh, Deborah Barber and the UKRI comms team, 
Sam Richardson and the events team, and last but by no means least, Jurat Hassan. Jurat uh, joined the MIC um, uh, shortly before lockdown uh, and has done a fantastic job uh, in steering us to this very successful event. So thank you to absolutely everybody and we'll look forward to um, seeing you again uh, next year in whatever format. So many thanks to everyone and um, all the best.